Well, one of the things I discovered whilst making this film, which is an amazing resource, is Pinterest. Couldn't live without it now. Sid Mead, you know, was a big design influence in terms of the world building, who did with the designer from Blade Runner. Uh, Ralph McQuarrie, who was the main designer for Star Wars. Akira was a big influence. And weirdly, Sony products from the 80s and 90s. Like as if we went back in time, and it's the future of the 1980s and early 90s that is kind of represented in this film. Paper Moon, uh, Rain Man, A Perfect World, the Kevin Costner film. And then there's a film from the UK called The Hit with Tim Roth, which is about them taking this guy to be assassinated and they go on this journey across Europe and they start to like him and they don't know what they're gonna do, if they're gonna kill him or not. The cost of building a set, like on a typical movie like this, is like say 200 grand to build a set. And if you get your crew small enough, it's cheaper to fly them anywhere in the world than it is to build a set. And so once you get it to that size, you start to be able to go, well, where's the best place in the entire world that we could set this scene? We actually did that and went to all these real locations around the world to film at. Quite often on a movie, when it's got a heavy visual effects component, other people who don't do visual effects will decide what you're going to build, where you're going to go location-wise, and what's going to be done in, in post-production. And they're kind of the least equipped people to make those decisions. And usually the visual effects people at the end of the process are like, why didn't you just, and why couldn't you just, and how come we're, you know, there's a lot of like complaints you hear. And so having a visual effects background, you can go, that's really, really hard to do in the computer. It's way easier if we just go here and shoot this. And then vice versa, someone will go, oh, we've got to go here and do that. No, 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 we don't have to do any of that. We can stick that in the computer really easy. And so I hope the one thing we gained was like an efficiency of like stuff we're doing in front of the camera versus stuff we're leaving to visual effects was like that divide was like quite rational. Like it felt like the right, the right balance, you know? Greg obviously worked on Rogue One. It's a bit of a genius. He did this very low budget indie movie, I think called Dune or something set in the desert. And it won one of those little gold statue things. And so he had to go and make Dune 2. I was like, is there anyone out there that you've seen the work of that you were really impressed with? And he was like, there's this one guy I met with Aaron. He was really impressive. And then the three of us kind of for a long time did a billion Zoom meetings. And it was kind of a masterclass from Greg about every image that I'd collected that I loved. We'd break down every piece of photography and go, how did you do that? Greg would just go, I think what they're doing there is this, and he'd explain it all. What we found is that the visuals that I was gravitating to all the time, it was like three main approaches that was causing everything to look the way it did. One of the, my favorite anecdotes about cinematography is from Blade Runner, where they would light a scene and they'd have like 20 lights and then Ridley or the DP, however it worked, would sit and look at it and go, doesn't quite feel right, does it? And they would turn every single light off and then one at a time, turn one light on. Okay, turn that one on, turn it off. Turn this one on, turn it off. And they'd pick the bravest one that did the most. And they would try and film with just that and maybe one more light. And it's a lesson in like less is more. And the big thing we did that was very different because the light so, is so sensitive light, you don't need very powerful lighting equipment. You know, just as you have, you have the guy holding the microphone, you know, the sound recorders the whole time. Couldn't we have the best boy holding the light? As I danced around the actors, like we do 30 minute takes without cutting, but the best boy, Nancy, would have to move around and reposition the light and I could feel Oren on the app kind of controlling whether, you know, the brightness, talking to Nancy about go back a bit, go back. Okay. Whenever you put a light behind someone, it always feels false, you know, because there's suddenly a light there that's not motivated. But if you bounce it off the ground, like if it hits an object in the room and then comes off it, your brain doesn't question it. And so mostly what we were doing was making it strong enough to hit the ground or hit the wall. It was a cheap little trick, but it, it suddenly felt integrated into the environment the second you do that. And all sorts of little tricks like this that we just learned along the way that became really useful. <laughs>